Where has the backlash against globalization led us to? So we are going to rely uh, heavily on the uh, opinion of uh, Nuri Rubini and that of the Financial Times as well as the, that of the Economic Policy Institute in this uh, video. So the United States uh, lost about uh, 5 million manufacturing jobs between January 2000 and December 2014. Uh, this was a wide, there's a widespread uh, misconception that rapid uh, productivity growth was the primary cause of continuing or continue all of, that, of those uh, job losses. That's the opinion of the Economic Policy Institute. The sharp drop in the rate of growth of manufacturing between 2000 and 2007 and uh, currency, currency manipulation led by China was responsible for the huge decline in manufacturing employment. Had output grown at the same rate of 3.7% per year that it did in the 1990s, employment would have uh, been stable during that period. Rapid growth of the manufacturing trade deficits was the most important cause of this low rate of, man of annual growth in manufacturing output between 2000 and 2007. That's the, the, the opinion of the, uh, the folks at the Economic uh, Policy Institute. So an editorial on the Financial Times, published in the Financial Times as early as uh, December 2021, had uh, this caption. Most uh, U.S. manufacturing uh, jobs are lost to technology, not trade. Okay. So, according to the same editorial, the U.S. indeed uh, uh, lost more than five million manufacturing jobs between 2000 and 2010. But according, but according to a study by the Center for Business and Economic Research at Ball State University. 85% of uh, those jobs, job do those uh, job losses were actually attributable to technological change, largely automation, rather than international trade. So, um, automation has transformed the American factory, rendering mi millions of low-skilled uh, jobs redundant. Faster spreading technologies like robotics and 3D printing will exacerbate uh, this trend. This is according to Mireya Solis. Uh, a senior fellow at, uh, at the Brookings Institute. So what is absolutely certain, uh, you know, given these two arguments uh, that um, one that it is uh, trade that is behind the uh, manufacturing job losses and the other that it's uh, automation, what is absolutely certain is that uh, there are indeed uh, millions of jobs, jobs that have been lost. So according to Nure Rubini, the estimates of uh, uh, job losses uh, due to trade increased over time as new research emerged indicated that the China shop was much larger than initially estimated. And secondly, the job losses were concentrated in, the, in states, in specific towns and communities where alternative employment was not easily available. They were not easily available and uh, in a lot of cases, in a lot of, in a lot of those uh, towns and cities and communities, the reason why some of those uh, manufacturing jobs uh, came here at, the, at the initial stage was because um, of the fact that, um, uh, yes, there wasn't there, there, was, there wasn't really much there at, at then, so they were, you know, they were taking advantage of that because maybe the, the, the employment would be cheaper, they will get, uh, the, the, the pay will be, yeah, the cost of labor will be cheaper and uh, there will be more will, willingness to, you know, to get people, you know, uh, employed. You know, so um, by them leaving now, you know, a lot of things have gone wrong. You know, so for these communities, the losses were severe, and some income support for those left behind did not materialize. So every uh, job uh, lost during the economic vitality from from hundreds of these uh, communities, affecting billions of Americans, especially those in the more industrial parts of the U.S. homeland. Therefore. For these people, globalization looked like something that was really disruptive. This is also why last year, 2020, um, the Financial Times in yet another uh, publication, that's the one you're looking at here, you know, uh, warned against this uh, backlash against globalization. This editorial was saying that the modern era of globalization is in danger, as you can see there. So the global division of labor shifting uh, manufacturing jobs out of rich, rich countries into poorer ones, reduce poverty in the developing world, and reduces prices in rich ones. 
policy makers, however, did need to, to compensate those who lost their jobs in the process and neglected the sense of pride and ownership people felt in their once striving communities. Now, supply chain disruptions and challenges in uh, procuring medical supplies have accelerated calls for countries and trading blocks to ensure that they have uh, sufficient capacity at home, prioritizing resilience over product producing goods uh, that were uh, uh, producing goods, uh, which is uh, where, where it's where producing goods where it's where, where it, is, it is the cheapest. So a virus uh, induced back backlash against uh, globalization is already evident. See what has happened of late with the emergence of the Omicron variant, but it should not uh, undo its um, many gains. Global global supply chains and uh, cooperation are themselves a source of resilience allowing countries to focus on their strengths and uh, share expertise. Spreading people and factories around the world allows companies to guard against their risks. Developed economies would uh, pay a price for increasing protection, pr protectionism, not just in higher prices and lost export markets, but a direct cost uh, to the taxpayer of, su of subsidizing uh, domestic production. This will make them more fragile and not less. Raising barriers to trade will make uh, it much harder for economies uh, to recover once uh, the impact of uh, COVID-19 abates. So the question is, do we want to deglobalize? That's uh, the question um, Rubinia asked. And he thinks uh, there are two parts. We could take uh, one part that favors the course of uh, trade and globalization the united and efficient uh, global marketplace while compensating and retraining those that are left behind. Consumers uh, worldwide will enjoy lower prices while employment and incomes in emerging markets will lift millions of people and global citizens out of poverty. That's one part of it all. The opposite part, call it the, 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 global, the, global, the deglobalization favors policies aimed at uh, bringing back the lost jobs to the advanced economies, call it reshoring, or preventing jobs from moving abroad in the first place. One can see how this sounds appealing. However, uh, the other risk that is important to keep in mind is that uh, deglobalization that aimed initially at preserving factory jobs could backfire because gradually over time, not only trading goods uh, that will be, will, will be restricted, but also trading services in data in information, in capital investment, and the movement of labor. So it's a kind of uh, a slippery, a slippery uh, slope. Of late, as we as we all know, the backlash against uh, trade and global globalization has taken many forms. First of all, it began in advanced economies in national countries. And now, for a couple of reasons, it is also gaining ground in emerging markets. Secondly, it started as a restriction to trade in goods, but now it is leading to greater restriction to trade in a variety of other aspects of uh, trade in the world. So there has been all sorts of uh, backlash in, in advanced economies as well as emerging ones in recent times. They have been driven by the backlash against the Washington Consensus, ac according to uh, Nure Rubini. So this consensus, the Washington consensus, is the doctrine that uh, emerging markets would succeed if they would open up to trade and globalization and to capital markets, and to capital movements, rather. If they would uh, liberalize, liberal, liberalize their, economies, their, their economies, they would prioritize their own state enterprises and follow policies of micro-stability like fiscal discipline and monetary policy targeting inflation. These policies unfortunately did not prevent a rising inequality in many emerging markets and led also to frequent uh, financial crises in these, those economies, according to Nuri Rubini. In part, triggered by botched uh, financial liberalization and unfettered uh, capital mobility that led to cycles of hot money flowing into these emerging markets in good times, but washing out of them in bad times. Leading to currency crisis, Bank of uh, sorry, balance of payment crisis, pr 
private and public debt crisis in a wide range of market, emerging markets. Some of the backlash in emerging markets uh, takes the form of uh, resource nationalism, nationalism or the opposition to the foreign takeover of uh, natural resources or energy markets. The backlash against globalization started as a backlash against the free trade in goods that was uh, leading to job losses for low and middle-skilled middle, middle, uh, blue-collar blue -collar workers in advanced economies. Trade, so, sorry. However, trading services usually was not open was not as open as uh, trading goods in uh, parts because uh, some trading services was not tradable. There are there are many other types of trade like uh, financial, legal, accounting that was uh, se severely restricted as uh, foreign services service workers and firms were not allowed to provide services uh, from a foreign location to local residents. However, with uh, technology, many services today are becoming more tradable. One can, can obtain the services of a cheaper advisor in, in India or elsewhere rather than a more expensive one in, say, California. And therefore, over time, trade in tech and other services uh, can also be restricted based on concerns about job losses or national security or other reasons. The backlash against the globalization, as one can imagine, is taking a broader form. One aspect of it is the backlash against the international migration of labor. It started in the US and uh, the United Kingdom, but has now spread to the rest of the European Union. Okay, yes, in Japan, it's, uh, it's, it uh, historically has uh, restricted the world uh, migration. The backlash against the migration is driven, driven both by economic reasons and social cultural anxiety. This is leading to economic, political, and climate refugees, and therefore the backlash against migration in advanced in advanced uh, economies is only likely to be sharp, to increase uh, sharply. There's also a movement of capital, which economists uh, usually suggest can be beneficial. Both uh, financial financial capital portfolio investment, foreign direct invest, invest, investment as well. Capital mobility allows uh, or makes for allocation of excess uh, savings uh, of some countries to real investment in countries with lots of good investment opportunities, but not enough national savings. Moreover, diversifying the the portfolio of uh, both uh, countries. International capital mobility is also beneficial in terms of high returns and low risk, for example. Um, no resident of a uh, small state will think it's optimal to invest only in firms producing in that uh, small state as opposed to all over uh, the United States, for instance, or uh, wherever that uh, location is. And therefore, the same principle applies to international portfolio investment, especially for savers in smaller economies where the domestic investment opportunities and local firms are limited. Foreign direct investment into a country does not only bring capital to uh, create new firms and factories that uh, create uh, jobs and incomes, it also brings new manage managerial skills and foreign technologies. But now, there's a backlash against international capital mobility and it is mounting and it's taking many forms. While outward foreign direct investment from advanced economies to emerging ones is seen as offshoring that leads to factory closures and job losses in those advanced economies, inward oriented investment into a country leads to fear that uh, natural resources of the, of the uh, countries or the factories are you know, being taken over by foreigners rather than nationals. So there's a fear of a loss of national sovereignty in emerging markets that benefit from inward foreign direct investment. This loss of control, local, local assets, resources and capital by big and various multinational corporations is mounted and financial capital into emerging markets is feared as hot money that comes in fast and also leaves fast in bad times leading to currency and financial crisis. So we have seen that in um, as it concerns uh, China's uh, involvement in a lot of uh, other countries, especially in uh, Africa, for instance, to say the least, in many African countries. We have seen uh, 
um, that clamor, you know. So at times, uh, national security is often claimed to prevent uh, foreign firms from owning domestic ones. Even before the recent backlash in the U.S. against uh, Chinese firms controlling manufacturing and uh, tech firms and advanced economies, national security claims were used to restrict such direct, such a foreign direct investment. However, the latest frontier of this anti-globalization backlash is the restriction to trade in technology, data, and information. National security is an aspect of it all. So Chinese firms controlling the personal data in apps like uh, TikTok or Grindr used by US citizens is considered, is considered a, a threat. Likewise, China could use this, the, uh, sim the similar argument to restrict uh, the collection of data on Chinese citizens by foreign firms, like the data on uh, driving collected by Tesla. In Europe, the concern about data are in part about privacy. Uh, the European Union demands that the data on, US, on EU citizens uh, collected by, by US and other big tech firms should be held on EU-based uh, servers. Uh, which, uh, well, to some on 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 face of it, sounds uh, reasonable, yes. But some of this is uh, purely uh, protection protectionism, um, according to uh, Nuria Rubini. The EU is trying to build its own uh, cloud industry, one that is uh, currently dominated by U.S. big uh, tech firms. Um, for the, therefore, the requirement of uh, local storage storage of data is an attempt to create a cloud industry through a protectionist through a protectionist through, through a protectionist stance the uh, likely greater restriction on trade in data and information technology based on national security and and or privacy and other cons con on other concerns could severely restrict the key element of international trade in the future where technology and data is uh, proving to be the key economic a key element of economic value and productivity. The latest, the latest uh, direction, the, the latest direction of protections is on uh, environmental and labor standards. They are now increasingly becoming more, uh, forms of uh, protectionism. An emerging market or a poor economy will have to have uh, the same wages and labor standards of uh, more advanced economies. So lower wages uh, don't simply imply that the poor, the, the poorer emerging market would have a competitive advantage in all manufacturing industries. Such so, so such country would have uh, would take such a country would have that advantage only in low value added labor intensive cases with uh, the labor costs adjusted for productivity, given the comparative advantage in some goods like apparel and uh, light manufacturing. The latest frontier of, prote of, of, of protections is uh, environmental standards. The EU and the United States are already increasing, increasing the introduction of uh, environmental standards and uh, trade agreements with emerging market economies. And now the global climate changes are becoming uh, more, more severe and the US and uh, Europe are at least in principle committed to reducing greenhouse, green, greenhouse gas emissions by 50% over the next decade. The typical emerging markets like China and India are planning to increase the emissions of the next decade as, as such it's a, you know it's going to be a a real tug of war also on the trade side the european union is already planning to introduce a border carbon tax this will be applied against imports from countries that don't have the same aggressive greenhouse gas emission targets this will be tariff aimed uh, to protect to prevent domestic uh, new industries like steel and other heavy carbon emitters from uh, losing competitiveness because they are forced to reduce carbon emissions more than uh, emerging markets. So a carbon tariff would help to prevent uh, such competitiveness uh, undercuts. So we are moving into a world in which there is going to be increased restrictions in migration, trade in goods and services, in capital investments, in labor, in technology, in data and information. So globalization, trade, and foreigners are, are easily becoming the target and scapegoats of an economic malaise that has uh, less to do with globalization, but more on technology and other factors. So 
thank you very much for watching this video.